Okay. Skiing arrived in New England from Europe in the 1930s. The mountains are small by Western standards, and the early skiing was on logging roads, but narrow trails were soon cleared by hand up the forested mountainsides with names like Wildcat, Slasher, Suicide Six, and Nosedive. The twisty trails could be pretty terrifying, as you can see in this Dartmouth Outing Club race, and most of the early skiing was straight downhill with minimal turning or technique. As you can see, as you can see, these guys just went for it. As the sport developed beyond local Scandinavians and college skiers, tourism promoters brought ski instructors from the Alps to teach the Arlberg technique, snow plows and stem Christies, on these long, stiff, hickory skis. In the 1930s, almost everyone was a beginner. Towering over all these early trails was Tuckerman's Ravine on Mount Washington. Few skiers were ever on the mountain before the 1930s, but by the mid-30s, scores of adventurers were exploring and making first descents down these steep chutes. Pretty soon, skiers were racing from the peak to the valley. The 1938 Inferno race was held on a foggy day, and Tony Matt dropped over the top cornice before realizing it, and shus the entire course without a turn. He said later he felt lucky to be 19, stupid, and have strong legs. <laughs> Mount Washington is infamous for the most extreme weather in the world. Al Sice ran the weather station at the top. His future wife lived in the valley, and every Friday after work, he would ski down from the 6,000-foot summit and climb back up on Sunday no matter what the weather and in the dark. The first Winter Olympics to include alpine skiing was held in Germany in 1936, and this is the women's team. All amateurs and wearing the style of the day. No Spider-Man outfits and no corporate logos. My aunt Sis and her pal Betty Woolsey were on the team. Sis, seen here, told me of the rigors of training, only allowed five cigarettes a day. Uh, Betty and Sis were amongst the first to ski on Teton Pass in Jackson Hole in the 40s, and I first skied there in 1960 with them, and we were the only party up there. But I digress, for here arrives the star of our show. The same long skis as everyone else, but a distinctly different style and approach to this new sport. In fact, here we have the first freestyle skier. He's my father, and he was a figure skater first and a skier second. With his sister Grace, they were U.S. national pair champions in 1934 and skated in the 32 and 36 Olympics. They also performed in skating carnivals, which traveled around New England and were a popular winter distraction in the days before television. While a student at Harvard College, my father was a ringleader of these shows. One year, he was on academic probation and forbid, forbidden to skate in the shows so that he would skate less and study more. In response, he invented the skating elephant so he could skate undetected <laughs> as the elephant's hind quarters. Coming to skiing relatively late in life in his 20s and used to being the center of attention and finding the long skis of the day hard to turn and cumbersome, he invented these short skis, which came to be known as goon skis. And uh, that's my mother on the right. With these four-foot skis, he could skate on the snow. And he was a relentless promoter of how much more fun these skis were than merely going in one direction. He would perform his figure skating loops, cross steps, spins, rockers, and twizzles. The more the merrier was his, always his philosophy. An account from the time says, they were holding hands and doing a crack the whip. I was bug-eyed as I watched them skate, do 360s, and take wonderful spills, laughing their way down the mountain. My father and his friend Al Sice would conspire to show off these new freestyle skis at every opportunity. 
Al would ski down slope, and when he had gathered a sufficient crowd of women around, my father would swoop by with a flourish of fancy footwork, over and over. They never tired of this. When looking into patenting his ski, he found this patent from 1888. The patent office deemed it to be the same as the goon, and my father didn't bother to uh, go to court to prove otherwise. No matter that this ski was 12 feet long, and the rear tip was only to be used if the front tip broke. Uh, here's my father, costumed as his mother-in-law at a party. Even with this brazen promotion, his brazen promotion, the goon was only popular for about 20 years. Being a short ski was also its downfall. They were slow, and who doesn't love to go fast on long skis? But the goon didn't die before a reincarnation of the elephant at an Easter parade in Stowe, Vermont, during the Mickey Mouse Club era. With my brother Paul in the front and me holding up the rear, <laughs> we all learned to ski on goons. So here we have the goon on top, and below today is K2 Shredditor. <laughs> ski Magazine says of the Shredditor, finesse and creativity are what bring it to life, and they are for expressive rather than aggressive skiers. If my father were around, I think he would like this rad ride. I took my old goons out recently and imagined my father doing the same. I can see him delighting in today's freestyle tricks on GoPro display. And I see his bow tie ruffling as he swoops across the snow, hamming for the camera with a twinkle in his eye. Ooh. Thank you.